He's, he was all in. Now, we ended last week as Micah claims, now I know the Lord will prosper me, seeing that I have a Levite as a priest. Micah truly believed, he truly believed that because he legitimized his family priesthood by installing a Levite, well, then God was obligated to bless him. Here is a really good question. Was Micah's, was Micah ignorant of the law that only allowed the sons of Aaron to be priests? Or was he simply picking and choosing rules that he was willing to follow? Now, I don't have a straight answer for you, but it is something to think about. It could have been one or the other, and it could have been a little bit of both. We certainly see in these days picking and choosing, right? Right from the word of God. Pluck out the things you want to follow and leave the rest. It really doesn't apply for today. Or claim ignorance. I didn't know. We are we are required to know God's word. So let's pick up our story in chapter 18, and I'm going to read the first six verses. Let's turn to Judges chapter 18. Uh-oh. Kenny, what'd you do? You brought the police with you? Good to see you. I'm glad you made it. Glad you made it, brother. All right, let me read the first six verses. Chapter 18, first six verses, and then I'm going to stop. Okay, Judges 18, verse 1. I do not. Are we all out? How many do we need? That's all right. What do we got to do? This is a class. Let's, let's get it done. Everybody's got to have a paper. All right, look, yes, I wasn't. It's a great turnout. I I'm, I'm feel honored that you, you all came out to, to uh, study with us, so I'm so thankful. I usually make 10. No, there's three lessons after this, Joan, unless Pastor George talks me into a fourth. So I, I can be talked into a fourth. It's fine, Pastor George. Um, but there's three more chapters, and I think I can get through the three chapters, one each week. That's the plan. Yeah, at least three or four weeks. The deep, right. I have to go deeper for that extra lesson, right? Okay, so let me read the first six verses, chapter 18. Let's take it in little bite-sized chunks here. In those days there was no king in Israel. Hint, hint. And in those days, the tribe of the Danites was seeking an inheritance for themselves to live in. For until that day, an inheritance had not been allotted to them as a possession among the tribes of Israel. So the sons of Dan sent from their family five men out from their whole number, valiant men from Zola, Zorah and Eshtol, to spy out the land and to search it. And they said to them, go search the land. And they came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and lodged there. And when they were near the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young man, the Levite, and they turned aside there and said to him, Who brought you here, and what are you doing in this place, and what do you have here? He said to them, Thus and so has Micah done to me, and he has hired me, and I have become his priest. And they said to him, Inquire of God, please, that we may know whether our way on which we are going will be prosperous. And the priest said to them, go in peace. Your way in which you are going has the Lord's approval. The author begins this, the chapter by writing once again, in those days there was no king in Israel. Now, this was not stated to clarify the fact that Israel had no king during the time of the judges since it was obvious to his readers and to us. We know that there was no king in Israel during this time. This is not, it's not for clarification. This was common knowledge. It was stated to point out that the events in chapter 18 and others like it 
occurred because there was no king in Israel. That's why they had it. Israel needed a king, but having no king was the central reason for the wayward behavior of the people. Now, I did say, and I want to make sure I clarify that it's not that God wanted them to have any king, right? It was important that it was his king, the future king, right? David was an example of the type of human king that the Lord wanted for us. But Jesus is going to be the ultimate king. He's the one that is really ultimately needed for all of us, right? All right, so make sure. I know that I want, I've said that before, but it wasn't just about any king. Also, whenever the Bible repeats itself, what does that mean? It's very important. Listen closely, okay? So the writer of Judges and the Holy Spirit is pointing something out again. This is important. Now, if you take the rest of verse 1 at face value, and think about it when you read this. If you take it at face value, then it seems to say that the tribe of Dan was never given their allotted territory. Did everybody catch that when they read it? See? So, I mean, it throw this out there. Both Moses and Joshua just forgot about this tribe. Whoops. I mean, everybody else got their allotment, but they forgot about little old Dan. Right? I mean, if you take it at face value, that's what it's saying. Dan didn't get their allotment. They must have overlooked Dan somehow and made a mistake. Now, I'll clear this up for you because I don't like the reading in the New American Standard. So if you take this at face value, we have a seeming contradiction. And if you study the Bible enough, when there's a contradiction, it's usually a misunderstanding of how the, the passage is being interpreted, right? Okay, but somebody could say, oh, this is a con contradiction. But this can be cleared up by looking at the Hebrew word nafal. You see that? Nafal, which means to fall. Now, I love my NASB, and usually I'm praising the NASB. I can't even praise the complete Jewish Bible, the, C the CJB, and others, but I'm actually going to praise the ESV, which is a very good English translation. Uh, Pastor Chaz would love this because he loves his ESV. Does anybody else study out of an ESV? That's an ESV? Right. So the ESV actually has it right. It says, actually, more accurately, Dan was seeking for itself an inheritance to dwell in, for until then, no inheritance among the tribes of Israel had fallen to them, right? So you got it? So if you are a conquering army and you defeat a city, it fell to you, right? So this is in battle, they've defeated it. So when you get that and you use the correct and proper Hebrew word there, it wasn't that they weren't given an inheritance, is it they didn't take their inheritance, right? It didn't fall to them. They didn't defeat the Canaanites in the land. Changes the whole passage, the whole uh, verse, I'm sorry. So I want to look at the passage back in Joshua 19. So we're going to take a left turn. We're going to go back to the book of Joshua, chapter 19. We're going to read a little bit about the tribe of Dan here. Joshua, chapter 19, one book back. And we're going to look at verse 40 through 48. Now, I want you to remember the, the, the phrase here, no inheritance among the tribes of Israel had fallen to them. I want to think about that as we read this. I'm going to go to this. Okay, everybody there? It, Joshua chapter 19, start, go uh, find verse 40. We're going to start there. The seventh lot fell to the tribe of the sons of Dan according to their families. And the territory of their inheritance was Zor and Eshtel. We know they took that, right? And... Ershemesh, and Shalabim, and Ajalon, and Ithla, and Elon, and Timnah. There's Timnah. Who was occupying that during this time? Philistines, right? And Ekron, Philistines, right? And 
Etke, and Gebethon, and Baleth, and Jihad, and Bene Barak, and Gath Ramon, and May Jarkon, and Rakon, with the territory over against Joppa, a really beautiful seaport, was supposed to be the tribe of Dan's. Now, this is what it says. I want you to focus it. It says, the territory of the sons of Dan proceeded beyond them. All right. So the Hebrew is a little bit different here. But understand that the idea is the same. The writer of the book of Joshua, which is Joshua, but this could have been a scribe who came on who added some additions here. But the writing here is that it proceeded beyond them. What does that mean? It means the same thing, that it didn't fall to the tribe of Dan. So we have the same idea here in verse 47. It proceeded beyond them, for the sons of Dan went up and fought with Lashem. That's Laish. We're going to study Laish today. Okay, Lashem is Laish, same thing. And captured it. Then they, they, struck, they struck it with the edge of the sword and possessed it and settled in it. And they called Lashem Dan after the name of Dan their father. This were the inheritance of the tribe of the sons of Dan according to their families. These cities were their villages. So they certainly were not forgotten about. They were given an inheritance. They're the cities. And the writer of the book of Joshua, Joshua, if he wrote this particular part, was telling us that they didn't possess it. It was their fault. They didn't, it didn't fall to them. Same idea. Okay, let's go to Judges chapter 1. So right turn. Let's go back to the very beginning of Judges. We're going to look at verse 34. Judges chapter 1. This is a review. This is at the very end of our first chapter, our second lesson. It says, Then the Amorites forced the sons of Dan into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down to the valley. So when Dan went to possess the land, they were driven up into the hills, and they couldn't come down to the valley. Does anybody want to take a guess, based on prior knowledge, it's an educated guess, what drove Dan into the hills? Right, but what do you think that the Amorites had? More than likely. What did some of the Canaanites have, which is very effective in the valley? Iron chariots. Now, it doesn't say specifically but I can almost guarantee you that the Amorites in this area had iron chariots and they chased Dan all over the valleys until Dan finally went up into the hills because you can't take an iron chariot up in the hills, right? So, you know, uh, your, your army can dominate, right, just like Sisera. If you're, you have iron chariots and you're, you're running around the valleys. So it seems like these Amorites had iron chariots. And Dan fled before them, wouldn't come down, wouldn't face them. And we know the story. They end up really possessing two cities, Zor and Eshtel. That's it, eventually. So right there, the author tells us in chapter 1 what happened to Dan. They, they never came down. They never defeated the Canaanites in the land. Kenny. Hold on to that question, and if I don't uh, go over that, then, then remind me. Because we're going to talk about Dan, and we're going to talk about the reasoning behind everything. But I just want to establish here that we have some history and background. They were given an inheritance. Joshua says in Joshua 19 that they were given it, but they, wouldn't possess, they couldn't possess it. Right? With the same language, and then just to understand moving forward that there was a reason. These Amorites were pretty pretty tough in the valleys, and it just drove all the Danites into the hills, probably because of iron chariots. So anyway, just a little bit of background. All right, so a little bit of what, what you're talking about. Dan never conquered their allotted territory. We talked about save Zora and Eshtel. They had a terrible time with the Amorites, and it was so bad that really eventually they just gave up trying. They gave up. Now. Here, I'll, here we go. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave this question for all of us since Kenny asked. The next phrase, the next sentence, sorry. Whose fault was it that they were not successful in driving out the Amorites? Whose fault? But the problem is that the Amorites had iron chariots, so 
it's understandable that Dan didn't take their territory because iron chariots are pretty tough. So I can't blame the Danites for just quitting. It's fine. But iron chariots trump God because iron chariots are tougher than our God. So, uh, right. It, it, Well, if you go up the hills in the woods and you run, the iron chain, they can't chase you. So you find them fleeing. And told them that's their, their land. And they didn't go take it. What's that called? We sung it. What, what song did we sing this Sunday? I'll give you a hint. Standing. Standing on the promises, standing on the promise, right, standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of God. It was the Danites' fault because God promised them this land. And like modern Christians, it is important to stand on promises, the promises of God. It hasn't changed since 1300, 1200, and this is about, you know, 1110, 11, 1200 BC, 1300 BC, right to now, 3,000 years ago, it hasn't changed. For the modern day Christian, this truth hasn't changed. We always can stand on the promises of God. You see, it was one thing to be given a lot of territory, and a lot of people think it's allotment, like somehow it, they won the lottery. Woo, ding, 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 ding. Here's your territory. You won the lottery. It wasn't like that. You know, this wasn't a lottery. They got some vacant area. And it was it was completely different when the territory has to be taken from a resist from a resisting enemy. Kenny, you're spot on. Everybody else, I know you were right with me. That requires faith and total dependence on God for the victory. No matter what, any way you shake this out, they had to have total dependence on God for the victory. Dan lost the spiritual battle before they ever lost on the field. That's what happened, right? I'm sorry, were you going to say? No, I was just going to say it was despised when, when I was on the Right. And I love that you brought that up, because think about it. Was Joshua and Caleb bigger and tougher than the other 10 spies? They were probably, you know, better archers or just better swordsmen. Those other guys were like probably skinny wimps, and that's why they were. No. The difference between Joshua and Caleb was a spiritual issue, right? A trust issue. The problem with the Danites was, was a spiritual issue. They, they lost the spiritual battle before they ever lost in the field. Now, just to give you a little bit of background, and this is off the beaten path, and not off the beaten path, but just a little side note. The two main reasons why for these allotments, so some of you are studying this and saying, well, why, why are they allotting land? Why didn't they just go in there and just start taking some land for themselves? Well, the allotments were to avoid squabbles over cities and areas of inheritance, because remember, when they went in, you inherited a land. It stayed in your family. It wasn't like you sold a house and you moved out of state. You pretty much stayed in your, within your inheritance, your allotted territory. At least that was the way it's supposed to be. Uh, a lot of uh, Hebrews moved around, and they were not in their own territory. That was certainly true of this time. But the allotments were so that you have inheritance, and you were to hold, and you were responsible for taking and dealing with the Canaanites that resided in your allotment. So it was not only to avoid squabbles, but it's also to give you a target to aim for. And this is the Canaanites that you were to conquer. That's the reasons. So in the end, the Danites lacked the faith necessary to complete their God-ordained mission. And that's the idea. You certainly do. And if we don't stand on promises, the things that, you know, that God has given us, right? In our scriptures, these are promises. But they could be there, but until we rest in them and grab them and bring them to ourselves, right? They're just promises from God. We, we have to actualize them, right? We have to see those promises and rest in, in those promises no matter what's going on, right? The Danites were given this land. The hard part was the faith, the spiritual battle. But boy, if they would have been had that faith 
If they would have said, look, God gave us this land, it wouldn't have mattered who was in the land. It doesn't matter how many iron chariots they had to face, right? So I think, you know, we see this as a spiritual issue, and we're going to talk about Danite's spiritual issue because it's going to come back. I'm going to continue to mention what strange things occur on this chapter and what they do and how they do it. Because I, I would see the Danites as a group of people that just lack faith, the whole tribe. So in verse 2, they decided to move. They can't defeat the land, so they're just going to go. Now, notice that even long before Samson, it seems that the Danites were only to capture these two cities. They had a whole list of cities there, two, only two. Now, chapter 18 shows us how Samson became to be part of the small enclave of Danites since most of his tribe moved north centuries before. But see, not all of them left. And I would argue with you that probably the Danites that stayed were those that said, this is our land that God gave us. I'm not moving. And they, they were stubborn. That's probably why Samson and his clan and his family members, his immediate family and a few other clans said, we're not leaving. We're just going to stay here. So that may have been part of their spiritual decision. Also notice how the dominant tribe of Judah was gracious enough to allow these small groups of Danites to have a possession for themselves. So looking forward, when the whole tribe moved north, except for small pockets of Danites, Judah didn't just run in and just grab Ashdol and Zorah. They allowed the tribe, the remaining tribe of Dan, to have a possession for themselves. I think it, it shows something about the tribe of Judah. They were gracious here. So here's how they did it. They sent five Danite spies to search the land to see if God would bless them with an inheritance elsewhere. Right? Let's see if God blesses us as we disobey him. These valiant Danites came to the home of Micah and decided to stay the night. So in verse 3, it says that they came near that they recognized the voice of Jonathan, the young Levite. Okay. Now, I think the idea here is that they recognize his dialect. That's the, the idea. This is easily explained as it would be like if we arrived at church on Sunday, this Sunday, we walk into church and heard a man or a woman talking with a deep southern accent. Right? We would immediately recognize their accent, and upon being introduced, we would ask them questions like, you know, where are you from? We know that they weren't from here, right, because of their accent. So where are you from? Why are you here? So there's questions in the text here at the beginning. is just normal and natural questions that you ask if somebody's out of place. They probably, he probably had a Judean or Southern accent, and they're wondering, well, what are you doing here? Now, there is a thought out there from some scholars who say that what happened was when he left Bethlehem, he stopped in Zor and Eshtol for a time, and then the people, the spies, somebody recognized him, and he stayed there for a little while before traveling up to Micah's house, but we, we don't have any information on that. It's probably more or less a dialect thing. They recognize his dialect, so they ask him some questions. And the surprising thing about this is there are already dialects in Israel amongst the tribes. And also he's a priest, so he probably was taught these things. So it's going to be different than your other examples there. Well, he's a Levite. He's not... No, he's not Right, right, right. The tribe of Levi, probably the Levites, had probably had a little bit of an accent. Or it might have been, you know, the tri some of the southern tribes had a little bit different of an accent. Than... Yes, uh, Jonathan, Jonathan. But, you know, you see that there's already dialects. Now, we did see that at the time of Jephthah, right, there was dialects. Remember where the Ephraimites were trying to get back across, right? And they wouldn't let them across the Jordan River without saying the word, and they were using the dialect. I can't even remember what that word is, to tell you the truth. But they, they, it, the dialects existed. It's funny. So I think that's what happened here. So they recognize the dialect. They wonder what he's doing here. And Jonathan, Jonathan tells them about his employment with Micah and how his duty was to be the family priest. Now, in verse 5, these Danites reinforced the impact that pagan superstitions had on Hebrew culture as they asked Jonathan to, the, to divine the future for them. 
They asked for his blessing. He's like, hey, we're going north. We're traveling around. Tell us how everything's going to go for us. They want to know how their expedition will turn out. The duty of an authorized priest was never to divine the future for Israel. So I don't know if you caught this when you're reading. What they asked of him is something you wouldn't ask a priest. Their duty was to make sacrifices and to perform ceremonies as a way of interceding for the people. They were not fortune tellers. So this, super, this superstition that they have is in line with Micah's belief, kind of like the same idea that having a Levite as a family priest would bring automatic blessings upon his household. And when you look closely, you can see the superstitions coming up. This is not taught in Torah law. So they asked Micah, hey, how's it going to go with us? Tell us a little bit of the future, right? Well, what did Jonathan do? Probably a lot like most of us do. Oh, go ahead. Everything's going to be great. You guys go ahead. The Lord has blessed you. Now, how is it that the Lord is not blessing this trip? How do we know that this trip isn't being blessed by God in some way? What are the Danites doing? Are they in God's will, or do you think they're out of God's will? Right. So we know for a fact that the Danites are not doing God's will. They don't have the Lord's blessing for disobedience. Right? We're never blessed when we disobey. Well, he told them what they wanted to hear, and we know that God would never give this fellow a word or a vision because he was an unauthorized priest, and he shouldn't have been you know, in his position. These men now satisfied, probably stayed at night, and after being fed and rested, got up the next day and continued northward. All right. Now, does anybody have any questions over the first six verses? Kenny. Sure. Questions, comments. Right. Absolutely. No, absolutely right. And a little bit of what, what Kenny said was, yeah, we need to take steps of faith, you know, one little bit at a time. We can't be like Dan, who lost their faith, right? And so it's very important daily for us to start our day in faith, step in the white, one step at a time, right? Standing on the promises of God, knowing that God is with you in all that you do. Good. Any other comments, questions? All right, I'm going to bite off a bigger chunk. I'm going to read to verse 20. Okay, I'm going to read verse 7, follow along with me to verse 20. Here we go. Then the five men departed and came to Laish and saw the people who were in it living, secure, uh, living in security after the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and secure. For there was no ruler humiliating them for anything in the land, and they were far from the Sidonians and had no dealings with anyone. And when they came back to their brothers at Zor and Eshtol, their brothers said to them, What do you report? And they said, Arise, let us go up against them, for we have seen the land, and behold, it is very good. And will you sit still? Do not delay to go to enter to possess the land. When you enter, you shall come to a secure people with a spacious land, for God has given it into your hand, a place where there is no lack of anything that is on the earth. Then the family of the Danites from Zorah and from Eshtol, 600 men armed with weapons of war, set out. And they went up and camped at kiriath Jerim in Judah. Therefore, they called the place Mahane Dan to this day. Behold, it is west of Kiriath Jerim. They passed from there to the hill country of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah. Then the five men who went to spy out the country of Laish answered and said to their kinsmen, Do you know that there are in these houses an ephod, a house and household idols, and a graven image and a molten image 
Now, therefore, consider what you should do. And they turned aside there and came to the house of the young man, the Levite, to the house of Micah, and asked him of his welfare. The 600 men, ar men armed with their weapons of war, who were with the sons of Dan, stood by the entrance to the gate. Now the five men who went up to spy out the land went up and entered there and took the graven image and the ephod and the household idols and the molten image while the priest stood by the entrance of the gate with the 600 men armed with weapons of war. And when these went into Micah's house and took the graven image, the ephod and the household idols and the molten image, the priest said to them, what are you doing? And they said to him, be silent. Put your hand over your mouth and come with us, and be to us a father and a priest. Is it better for you to be a priest to the house of one man, or to be a priest of, to a tribe and a family in Israel? The priest's heart was glad, and he took the ephod and household idols and the graven image and went among the people. Hmm. Good stuff. Okay. After the five men left Micah's home and did some reconnaissance, they finally stumbled upon an almost perfect place for their tribe. Laish was a very peaceful city inhabited by an equal peaceful people. Very peaceful people. The, inhab the inhabitants of Laish were ethnically Sidonians, who, for some unknown reason, unknown reason that we don't know about, they moved away from the city of Sidon. Now, I don't know if you can see up here, but if you look all the way up to the right, the city of Sidon is listed there. And then if you follow the end of these lines all the way up, that's where Laish is. But, so there's a little bit on the map there about like finger length here that the distance between Sidon and Laish. Now, by car, it's probably an easy jaunt, a little bit to drive down the road, but on foot, they were far away from their own brothers. So Sidon was Sidon here, you see, it's right on the Mediterranean coast, right? It's an important city of the Phoenicians that lay along the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, Mediterranean sea. So this travel here of this group of S Sidonians sounds a little bit like the Old West as Americans headed west to make a new life for themselves. So something like that. So they, they just went in a group. And in verse 7, the NASB says, there was no ruler humiliating them for anything. It's a kind of an odd statement. It's very hard when you look at it. The read in the NASB is, is tough there. And what does it mean that a ruler was humiliating them? It's really simple. It was an odd statement, but it simply means that the Laetians weren't on any king's land, therefore under his protection, nor did they have a treaty with a local king for their protection. So there's a plentiful uh, local kings that they might have made a treaty with. But this was not the case with this group. Rather, they were basically, it's telling you, they were fully autonomous and independent. That's what the deal was. They had no treaty with anybody. If they were attacked, no king would come to their aid. They weren't under protection, nothing. And so that's the idea of a ruler humiliating, kind of like lording it over them and, and being their boss. That's the, the old expression there. So they were fully autonomous. They were independent. In other words, they were a peaceful people that had no protection and lived too far away from Sidon for, for the relatives to offer any help, if they were going to offer help. Well, this was just perfect for the Danite spies who couldn't wait to report back to their brethren. Now, I am told, and I was going to put slides up for you, sorry, uh, maybe another time, but I am told that this is a beautiful, very beautiful place to visit. If you, I mean, you can go on your computer and put Dan in Israel, and you look, you can actually see the old um, uh, hill area where they had their false worship and some other things. You can look at the, the, the area of Dan, beautiful and lush up there. Um, it is a beautiful place. Uh, so you can see those. I was going to show you a little bit of Dan, but maybe another time. So it was a great land, beautiful. Uh, but most importantly, I think it was that they were vulnerable to attack. It was going to be easy to take. 
they connected their good fortune here with the oracle given to them by Jonathan. You can see how they've misled themselves. They're already disobeying God by moving. But boy, look at this good fortune. We found a land unprotected, easy to take. God is with us. You can imagine what they thought spiritually. It must be Jehovah who is behind this blessing. Verse 10. Once again, we have superstition trumping the actual word of God, right? Because nobody went back and checked, wait, hey, hold on a second, wait, we're doing something wrong here. Verse 11 describes the war party sent by the tribe of Dan northward. They sent 600 soldiers, which was a very moderate amount of people. 600 soldiers is not a lot. This indicates the ease with which they thought they could take Laish. They only needed 600 soldiers. Now, don't mistake this as being the total amount of those who traveled north. So if you read this and you're just at a cursory reading, you might think, well, 600 Danites migrated. No, the migration of Dan is much more. This is 600 soldiers here would guard the column of migrating Danites and would be the ones who would actually, once they got up to Laish, they would attack the city. So they needed this initial group of 600 men to not only protect this column of, uh, of people migrating north, uh, they would need that, those soldiers to attack Laish and just take the city. Many women and children and livestock and other values, uh, valuables were part of this column, and they needed protecting. Now, after camping by the city of Kiryat Yarim, they continued on their journey north and ended up by stopping very close to the home of Micah. Now, you can look at the map, and again, I don't know how much you can see. You can see the very beginning of the lines. That's Zor and Eshtol, and it goes up. Now, we don't know where Micah's house is, but this has them going, if you can see, right? This has them going a little bit east and then north, right? But maybe it was more of a straight line, so Micah's house would have been a little bit more towards the Mediterranean Sea. We don't know. But that's the supposed, that's the guess at the line of which they may have taken uh, going all the way up there. So those spies traveled, and this column is traveling a long way, long distance. Dan is up at the top of Israel, where eventually the land became the known from Dan to Beersheba, Beersheba being the very bottom, right, south, southern portion of Judah. So Dan, Dan is, you see the uh, Sea of Galilee, and how you go around the Sea of Galilee, and there's still a little bit of a joint. It's not very far from Damascus. No, no, it's not, right? Damascus is pretty close. Yeah, they went well up north. Um, so they, they ended up staying at the home of Micah. We don't know where that is. And I think they were not there for hospitality this time. Why do you think they ended up traveling this route? They were heading north anyway. They just happened to be passing by, you know, like a relative or a friend that just happened to be stopping by. Sometimes you know that it's for a specific reason, right? Nobody just pops over. Usually there's a reason behind it. So why do you think they did this? Well, the five spies, more than likely, intentionally brought the Danites this way. There's an indication in the text that they didn't let everybody know what they were doing, but they kind of dragged them this way. The spies are, are bringing them this way on purpose, right? Right. Right. But what do they need from Micah? Why stop at Micah's house? No. Well, what did Micah have that the spies saw that they wanted? What's that? The household idols, the car, well, what? Yeah. They, they're there for some booty, for some spoil here. That's why. The five Danite spies, I think they brought them this way. They went to their tribal leaders and informed them of the situation of Micah. They have... So they have a priest, they have a Levite, they have these household idols, teraphim, they have this molten image, a graven image, they have everything they want, and they have an ephod, a priest's robe, 
everything we need. So if we're going to move, right, we need all these things because we got to have our own priesthood. Pretty bad. What's No, we're, we're at the part where they stop by Micah's house. They have 600 men sitting by Micah's gate, by the gate of the house. They're not, they're not ransacking anything. They're just there. The five spies go up to greet Micah. They greet the young priest. So that's where we're at right now. And I was asking you, why do you think these five spies brought the column this way by Micah's house? And we're going to learn out why. So it seems like they went to their tribal leaders. The leaders decided... If they were going to make this trip and relocate, they were going to need gods, household gods, household idols, and a priesthood to preside over everything. You see how bad their thinking is right away. Why not simply ransack Micah's house of God? And that's, that's, that's what they decided. Hey, let's just ran ransack and steal from this man. Remember that from last week that a Beit Elohim could be a room inside a home or a separate building used for worship. But if you look at verse 14, if you notice, by the plural in verse 14 of houses, or the Hebrew word is bayit, right? There were houses on his property. So there's more than one house. The Beit Elohim was a separate building from the main house. So it wasn't just a separate room. That This, this kind of indicates that he had a separate house, a separate building, his Beit al was that was attached to the house, okay? His, when it refers to the houses. Um, this reinforced the fact that Micah's family was very wealthy, as only the most well-to-do families could afford such an extravagance. Kenny. Okay. Right. We don't know who they were. But Dan would have had their own. Well, the people themselves were following. That, that, that is a fact. But remember we talked about tribalism before. Okay, tribalism exists on clans. So you had, the, you had a, the tribal leader, probably one man like Joshua for his tribe, like Caleb came for his tribe. You probably had a tribal leader who was at the strongest, most powerful clan. And underneath him were all the rest of the clans. You know, a little bit like, uh, what is that? Where, uh, freedom! And they have all the clans, right? What is that? With Mel Gibson? Braveheart. <laughs> Braveheart. Yeah. They had all the clans, you know, and they had all the yeah. flags. Yeah. So, yeah, tribalism. So, yeah. you had, so they had leaders, but they were clan leaders. So, you answer to your clan leader. So, if you were just, say, uh, um, a young man who, don't, you're, you're the third son. You would answer to first to your father or your family. But none of that's revealed. No, it's not revealed. And then they would answer to the clan leader. A clan means it's maybe a family or two or extended family, like we're the farmer clan, the farmers with all a little bit of our extended family. And then you know the clan leaders would 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 all answer to a clan leader or maybe a group of clan leaders who you know formed a, a decisioning body. You know, men of the leadership uh, of that clan. And then you had, you know, so it kind of worked its way up. That's, that's what it's here. So it's more than likely that these five spies brought him here. Look, they may have talked it over with the leaders and they had it in the plan before they left Dora and Eshtar. But th it seems like the, it indicates from the, from the passage that they brought him this way and then they went to their tribal leaders more than likely and said, hey, this is what this guy's got. This is, this is stuff we need. He has this, that, the other thing, and all that. And the leader said, go get him. Sent the 600 men are now waiting outside Micah's house. That's where we're at, okay? Good. All right, so this is houses. So it seems to indicate that there was two separate houses. He had his own separate house. His own Beit Elohim was a separate part. It was a separate building. Uh, and I'll ask you the same thing that we asked. We talked about Mike and his mother last week. I'm going to ask you the same question, but now direct this toward the Danites. Did the Danites do these things for the sole purpose of angering God and committing evil? Right. And a little bit what 
what Kenny's as asking about the people, the, the, the regular people, the common folk. I don't think anybody from the tribe of Dan is purposely committing evil. I'm not necessarily sure that they, they did, but rather were following commonly held beliefs and practices of the time. This goes along the line with Annabelle's thinking last week, as Annabelle took the softer side of things, right? You changed your mind after? Oh, I like that, that you, you had that view. You, you counteract Liz. Liz is not here today. Liz, you're home. Sorry. Yeah, she's, you know. Uh, they were very much a product of their environment, and there is truth to that. The blind leading the blind, I guess, is a good expression. They certainly didn't bother to check their actions against Scripture, and maybe they preferred to remain ignorant of God's Word because then they would have to justify their actions. People do that all the time, right? Sounds familiar. We have that same thing going on today. Some believers actually twist the very meaning of the Bible truths, of Bible truths, because if not, they would be called to the carpet. So to make themselves feel good, they twist Scripture. So the five spies brought with them all 600 soldiers who waited by the gate, and as they went in to get everything from Micah's Beit Elohim, Jonathan, who may have thought that these spies were here to greet Micah, you know, for a friendly reason, noticed that they started taking all the items out of the house, the Beit Elohim, the graven image, the molten image, the teraphim, which is the household idols, uh, an ephod. So he asked them, what are you doing? And they tell him, be quiet and consider this. Is it better to be a priest over a single family or over a whole tribe? Of course, without much thought, once again, Jonathan understood their offer. He gets to serve as a priest over the entire tribe of Dan. They didn't have to ask him twice as he immediately went with them. And I end this by saying, so much for loyalty. <laughs> Right. He got a promotion. He did. Wasn't very loyal to, to Micah. So he, if you look at the, read the text, he started helping out. All right, here we go. Let's go. And off they went. All right. Any questions over 7 through 20 or something I didn't cover or a question you might have had? Mayor, comment. Right. They are. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's why the word is so important to us because it gives us that line. It gives us, you know, those truths, those foundations with which to live by. You know, and if we measure our life in the light of Scripture, we can stay out of trouble for the most part. Not always, but, you know, we get wayward. But once you get rid of the word, God's word, and in our time, once the Bible has no authority anymore, then you get into all kinds of problems, right? Bible, God's word has to be the final authority. It has to be the measuring stick. And you have to be in the word in order to know. Because if you're not, and you fall away, or the Bible is no longer authoritative in your life, then you can convince yourself of all kinds of things. And you probably can convince yourself, Mayor, of doing that the things that you're doing is not really, you know, displeasing to God. Right? I'm not necessarily sure that the, the, the tribe of Dan or the people who are going along for the ride, Ken, are, are thinking that this is something really, really bad. I, I don't think they knew any better. They, you know, God's going to hold them accountable. There's going to be some consequences for what they do in this chapter. But that doesn't mean that on, on a you know, personal level that they thought that somehow they were angering their God and through, thought through the consequences of what this is going to mean for them. Right. 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 
There has to be, yes. There has to be a rejection of God's word or some form of rejection of God himself. Yeah. All right. Ken. In their own eyes. No, it wasn't. Right. They were doing it with their own strength. That's what I was saying. You know, I think it was they lost the spiritual battle before they even took the field. You know, there was something in the tribe of Dan where they didn't have enough leaders who were spiritual like Joshua or Moses. You know, they were rudderless. Dan was a prime example of this, this rudderless kind of existence here that a lot of tribes had. And they fell into that. So, no direction. No, yeah, unfortunately, Dan might have been a real good dude, the Dan, the, the, the patriarch, you know, uh, but I don't, the, the tribe certainly fell. So they had, they had their problems. All right, let's uh, finish the chapter. We're going to start reading in uh, verse 21. Let's read 21 to the end so we can finish up tonight. Then they turned and departed and put the little ones and livestock in the values in front of them. I didn't mention this in the notes, but that would be for protection, and they provided the 600 as a rear guard. So they put the children in front and the women, and when they had gone some distance from the house of Micah, the men who were in the houses near Micah's house assembled and overtook the sons of Dan. And they cried to the sons of Dan, who turned around and said to Micah, what is the matter with you that you have assembled together? And he said, you have taken away my gods which I made and the priest, and have gone away. And what do I have besides? So how can you say to me, what is the matter with you? The sons of Dan said to him, Do not let your voice be heard among us, or else fierce men will fall upon you, and you will lose your life with the lives of your household. So the sons of Dan went on their way, and when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back to his house. Then they took what Micah had made and the priest who had belonged to him and came to Laish to the people, quiet and secure, and struck them with the edge of the sword, and they burned the city with fire. And there was no one to deliver them because it was far from Sidon, and they had no dealings with anyone, and it was in the valley which is near Beth Rehob. And they rebuilt the city and lived in it. And they called the name of the city Dan after the name of Dan their father, who was born in Israel. However... The name of the city formerly was Laish. The sons of Dan set up for themselves the graven image, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. So they set up for themselves Micah's graven images, which he had made all the time that the house of God was at Shiloh. Okay. So the Danites collected everything they came for from the house of Micah, and they turned northward for their journey to Laish. Micah and some of his neighbors and townsfolk were not too happy about Dan's thievery. They came out in force to confront the Danites. Now it seems that they must have been extra upset because most, if not all of them, worshipped, probably worshipped at Micah's, Micah's Beit Elohim. Remember, we had the same type of reaction when Gideon destroyed his father's Baal altar, right? And the townsfolk wanted to know who did this, and they came out in force to try to find out who destroyed their altar. So it seems to me like some of these townsfolk, probably and most of the townsfolk, worshipped in this Beit Elohim. So they came out in force. The problem was that um, they were pursuing 600 fighting men. And like most men, their anger got the best of them, and it could have ended in disaster for them. They certainly were outnumbered. 600 men did not come to go up against the tribe of Dan. So they had inferior numbers. So they were thinking in their anger. The men of Dan asked Mike and his people, what's the matter with you? Now, the Danites knew full well why they were being followed, but probably couldn't believe 
probably the nerve of these people to complain of, to them since they were so outnumbered. They were probably offended. Like, you know, what's your problem? And this was 600 fighting men. So they basically told them to stop complaining about their stolen goods, shut up, and turn around before we kill you. That was the idea here. Now, the proverb that comes to mind here is discretion is the better part of valor. Okay? They decided they would, they would rather live. It's a good choice. So Mike and his comrades return home empty-handed, and the Danites continued on. Now, in verses 27 to 29, it explains that the Danites were successful in what they came to do to the people of Laish. They attacked the city. They killed all the people. Then they burned the city with fire. Yeah. And nobody came to their help. They didn't have any allies. And when their task was accomplished, they rebuilt the city of Laish, and they renamed it Dan after their ancestor, their tribal name. And once their city was built, they set up the false worship system. And that's important to know. They did not, they did not build Dan and then set up a great temple to Yahweh or Jehovah. It's false. Jonathan was now their high priest with the silver image that was stolen from Micah as a centerpiece in whatever worship center they built. And again, you can see the ruins of this worship center if you research Dan, Israel, you'll see it, the altars and everything else. Now, last week I told you I'll give you a few more details about verse 30, so I hope I do a very good job of explaining this, and we're getting a little late, so I'm going to try to explain this as best as I can. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. I'm going to do the best I can here. Why do I know that Jonathan was from, not from the line of Aaron? How do I know this? Moses had one brother, Aaron, and one sister, Miriam. Now, the line of Aaron, Moses' brother, Right, was designated as the priestly line from Mount Sinai forward. Aaron had four sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. And all of them served as priests with their father as high priest. That's how it worked, only from those, the line of these men. Moses had two sons, Gershom and Eleazar, or Eleazar. This is the Gershom mentioned in verse 30, so I'll just pop that out there. This is Gershom, the son of Moses. So if this is Moses' son, Gershom, then why is Manasseh listed as his father? Now, first thing, there is no Manasseh connected with the tribe of Levi. You look at all the Levitical lines, and there is no Manasseh in there. So you can't find a Manasseh that you can point a finger to. There's no son of Levi or ancestor of Levi named Manasseh. Okay, that's number one. If you study Hebrew, which most of you don't, you know that there are no vowels. There's only consonants, okay? The vowels are understood. Everybody know that? All right, so they add the vowels. Um, so they are, they, are, they are added as just an understood factor here. There's only consonants. So some of the original texts have this name as M-S-H, okay? That's Mem, Sheen, He. That would form the name of Moses, believe it or not. His name isn't Moses in Hebrew, it's Moshe, M-O-S-H-E-H -E or something, Moshe. Uh, so it's M-S-H, it always forms Moses. An N or a Nun seems to have been added by an editor of the text, but they only added a baby Nun written above between the Mem and the Sheen. All right? So some of the copies read, and I put it like a lowercase n so you understood, but it really, in the Hebrew, it's up above, in between the two letters, but it's kind of up above, and it's really small. It's a small noon, just a little baby noon. So some copies read, mem, noon, shin, he. Therefore, we get Manasseh. Believe it or not, that's the word Manasseh in Hebrew, adding the vowels in there. If you follow the, cons the, the consonants, M, N, S, H. Got it? The one thought is that the editor added the tiny noon so the reader could read it as Moses or Manasseh without corrupting the text. But the question is, why do that? Why, if he did add the noon, why did he do that? Well, one rendition claims that Jonathan was the son of Gershom, the son of Moses. The other claims 
that he is the son of Gershon, the son of Manasseh. The thought was that this early editor wanted to protect the reputation of Moses by assigning this false priest to another family. Now, this is what Morris and Kundal write in their commentary. The reason for the amendment may have been to safeguard the reputation of this great leader, Moses, by excluding him from the pedigree of this time-serving and idolatrous Levite, jo uh, Jonathan. The alteration of Manasseh may have been designed to suggest a correspondence of character between the Levite, Jonathan, and the most wicked king of, of Judah's kings in 2 Kings 21, a device which would bring discredit upon the Danite priesthood institute, instituted by Jonathan. In other words, not any Manasseh. This is Manasseh, that absolutely horrible king of Israel. Right? He was awful. Probably killed Isaiah, that Manasseh. So they think that maybe a, a later editor was protecting Moses, but also ascribing this this idolatry and, and using the name Manasseh. It's just a guess. Dan was one of the two sanctuaries set up by Jeroboam I. So when the kingdom split, all right, Jeroboam, like Solomon died, his son Rehoboam was going to rule over all Israel, and the kingdom split. And Jeroboam took the ten northern tribes, and Rehoboam, Solomon's son, took the southern tribes. And now we have a divided kingdom. Everybody understand? Now, Jeroboam wanted to keep all of the north. He wanted to keep them in the north worshiping. So he set up two golden calves, one in Bethel, one in Dan. Right? So that's what he means by that. So Dan was the one of the two sanctuaries set up by Jeroboam I at the time of this disruption in order to counteract the centripetal influence of Jerusalem in 1 Kings 12, 26 through 30. The golden calf or bull he set up may have been modeled after the molten image of Micah. And we talked about how when they make a molten image, a bull was very popular. You could make a molten image. So, but we don't know that. That's just a guess, kind of some, you know, drawing some lines there. The bottom line is that it's almost unanimously agreed that the reference was originally to Moses. Also, the Septuagint. Everybody know what the Septuagint is? That is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. And the Greek Septuagint has the name Moses in the text. Now, there are some, very little, Greek Septuagint manuscripts that do actually have Manasseh, but the bulk of them in the Septuagint have Moses in the text. Most scholars agree that this is Moses. All right? The Septuagint was written about 250 years before Christ and involved 70 Hebrew scholars. They had to agree on the translation. And those 70 scholars agreed unanimously that it was Moses. You understand? So it gives a very good case, although nothing's 100%, that this is Moses, and you can see that it was for the protection. They wanted the protection, protect his reputation. Now, why? You have to understand that this is an embarrassment to Israel that Dan did this. Okay, This is written by the author in a very, very negative light. This is not just to say, hey, that great tribe Dan, we want to tell you what happened. This is what happened to them. Kind of weird. You know, they didn't stay down south, but they took this territory, and now they're up there. And this is not for information. This is, to, this is the reason why. This happened is because there was no strong leadership, no spiritual leadership, because there was no king in Israel. And a great example of everybody doing what was right in their own eyes is this tribe, Dan, who went north in disobedience to God. And you know what happened? They went up north, and they never, ever served Jehovah again. It was false worship from this tribe. From here for the rest of their history, they did not serve Jehovah. Now, was it? Quite possibly a syncretistic mix. Yeah, there's, there's a chance that that was the case. But they truly abandoned their God. And in the book of Revelation, the tribe of Dan is missing from the 144,000. There's 12 tribes of, of Israel. 
12,000 from each tribe, the 144,000, there is one tribe missing from that list, the tribe of Dan. In the book of Revelation, I don't know, does that mean that Dan, because they forsook their God, I mean, that is what most scholars think. What's that? No. Now, again, that's just conjecture. I couldn't tell you. When it's history, I'll tell you. And if I make a conjecture and say that I agree, and it's false, and Dan is listed in, in, right on the New Jerusalem, uh, you can all laugh at me and point at me and you know joke with me uh, for all eternity. Ah, you thought, Dan, you were kind of wrong. Remember we went over judges? I don't know. Maybe Dan will be on New Jerusalem, or the 12 tribes are, on New Jer are named right there on New Jerusalem. That's, I don't know. No, because, uh, no, it wouldn't make it a 13th tribe. Because, it's, it's yeah. It's hard to explain because Levi, yeah, because if you do 12 tribes, when you take out Dan, you have 13. Because Le there's 12 tribes that got a possession, but Levi was the 13th. All right, so there was 12 sons. Joseph was a son, but remember that, right, right, Manasseh and Ephraim, were from Joseph. So there is no tribe of Joseph. There's a tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh. So I could say to you, maybe in eternity, it's going to be the tribe of Joseph again, and we're not going to separate Ephraim and Manasseh. Or the tribe of Levi is listed. Maybe the tribe of Levi is never listed. I don't know. But if you look at the list, I'm just saying, I'm not going to read it to you, but you look in Revelation. Look at the list of 144,000. Dan's missing. I don't know. It does, is that what it means? I, I would, yeah. Where, where, did you get, where did you get that from? Yeah. You got a lot of information in that head of yours. <laughs> I, I, if, you, if it is. I, uh, That is the that is in Genesis where they they're bl he's blessing all the sons right. Yeah, Jacob's blessing his twelve sons, and there's lots of prophecy in there about how the, you know, how the the twelve tribes do. Dan is in there, but it's not good about Dan. I didn't go over that when went we we would have we would have went over, but good catch, good job. Dan. Well, you could say it's Dan, but not the Israelite kind. <laughs> so it's Revelation 7. Here are 12 tribes. Uh, tribe of Judah, tribe of Reuben, tribe of Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, There is. You're, you're right. I'm just giving you that. If you do read some scholars, they'll look at that and they'll say, we wonder why Dan's missing, and they, they, they actually point back to the book of Judges and their history. But you're right. There's a lot we don't know. Yeah, that's, so yeah, they're not at it. And, and there's no Ephraim and Manasseh, right? There was just the tribe of Joseph, right? Is that what it is? Which, what do you want repeated, Joe? Oh, Genesis, which verse was that? Genesis 49. Genesis 49. Dan gets one verse. Did he get, did he get one verse? No, they said it when uh, Israel prophesied concerning... No, no, Dan, the verse about Dan is just, just one verse, 16. 
Okay. Okay. No. In Genesis 49, you can read about Dan. Genesis 49, 16 through 18 is about, is, is Jacob, his father, prophesying about his future. You can read about Dan. In Revelation 12, right, we have the 144,000, or 7, sorry. Revelation 7, we have the 144,000. Yes. Jacob blesses his 12 sons. He gives a blessing to them. Yeah, they're standing around the bed. He's on his deathbed. Dan gets a bad report. <laughs> it doesn't, I, I haven't, I haven't dissected the verses. I know that you could study that and it's, it's, it's complex. So if I, if I were to do that and, and, and it's, it's a lot, it's a lot. No, that's in Genesis 49. Genesis 49, blessing of Jacob. Revelation 7 is about the 144,000 witnesses where Dan's not included in it, if you want to read that. <laughs> you know, the reason why they could be in Ezekiel, the reason why, you know, could be simply because they were forgiven. Maybe they at that point are forgiven. Maybe they don't play much of a part in the, in the tribulation, but in eternity, the tribe is restored. You know, they could be restored. In the millennial kingdom, they could be restored. Dan could be restored. I don't know. I mean, maybe that's it. Yeah, so whatever it is, <laughs> Genesis 49 is not good, right? Yeah. So let me just finish this because I know it's, it's getting on 8.30. It's a great study. If you have any other questions, just ask me afterwards so I can let everybody go. I just want to say the chapter ends, just read these, with the Danites, with their false worship. And they set up Micah's silver image as a centerpiece all the time the house of God was at Shiloh. Shiloh was a city where the wilderness tabernacle presided during the time of the judges. It was moved there in Joshua 18.1, and it was dilapidated, but it was still functioning during the time of Eli the priest. And that's in the beginning of the book of 1 Samuel. You can go right into the, book of, the beginning of 1 Samuel and read, and you're going to pick up where we left off here in Judges when you read the beginning of 1 Samuel. So it was there in Shiloh. It was dilapidated. Shiloh was certainly where the official priesthood functioned as opposed to the false priesthood of Dan. So these would have been a opposition to each other. Um, many scholars think that the Philistines destroyed the tabernacle during the events of 1 Samuel 4, when they took the Ark of the Covenant in battle, they're not sure. There is no historical, there's not, sorry, biblical evidence, but archaeology has actually backed this idea that it was taken during that time. So they think that that tabernacle was destroyed uh, during, just right in and around that time that they, were, they took the Ark. The point is that if these events occurred during the beginning of the time of Judges, then Dan had this worship center functioning during most of the time of the period of the Judges. So, you know, we had the true worship system of God in Shiloh and the false one in Dan. So maybe they were, right? They both bit the heel of Israel, like, you know, as the, the serpent's tribe. Yeah. The serpent's tribe, the Satan's tribe, right? Led the, the people astray, led a whole tribe astray. Anyway. All right. So, again, if you have any questions, ask me afterwards so I can let you guys go. Thank you so much for spending extra time with us. Uh, we went an hour and a half. Unbelievable. So here I thought, oh, I, I didn't write too much. And you cut things out and think, oh, I'm pretty good. But it's great because you're asking questions and you're interacting, and that's awesome. And you're an excellent Bible student, so I'm very proud of you. Um, just very, very pleased to be teaching you and very thankful. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for all that came out tonight. Thank you for the questions and the, the comments and the, uh, the way your people love your word so much that you're interacting with your word and, and really looking at the text and drawing conclusions and looking at uh, Genesis 49 and, and doing all those things uh, that make uh, you know, uh, studying the word so important. 
And we just appreciated the gifts that you've given each one of us. We just thank you for the study. We just thank you for all those who are patient at home, uh, who uh, tune in and who can't interact but are so faithful to come and join us and, and, and uh, join us for this study every Thursday night. So thank you for all that came out. Bless them this day. Bless them for the rest of their week. Help us to keep in mind all the things that we've learned from our study. Uh, keep everyone safe.